And welcome to Let Them Talk. I'm Paul DiRienzo. And my guest, well, Joni isn't with us. Uh, she'll be with us in a week or two, but and we're, we're uh, rooting for her to get back here as soon as possible. Join us again on Let Them Talk. But my guest tonight is Doug Green. And Doug, um, well, he wears so many hats, and I neglected to ask what hat you're specifically wearing tonight. How do you want to introduce yourself? Drug policy expert? Yeah, I'm one of the co-founders of Cures Not Wars, which uh, advocates for... Mm -hmm. new treatment methods such as Ibogaine and also right. is the lead organization behind the Worldwide Marijuana March, okay. which happens every spring. But I do wear many hats in drug policy and involved with a lot of different groups. Right. And we have a lot to talk about, some interesting events. I mean, we have a new governor, for example, in New York State. Relatively new. Relatively new governor. Well, he was a, uh, he's been on the scene for a while politically, but uh, he's new in the sense of almost every governor has been before New York has really been an opponent of liberalizing or legalizing the Rockefeller drug laws, so there might actually be a breath of air we're hoping and change, because this uh, new governor had, before he was governor, many times made statements criticizing well, Paul, the Paul, he, didn't, he didn't just make statements. He actually got himself arrested outside the governor's midtown office. Well, protesting the Rockefeller Right, doing drug civil laws. disobedience. Right, and now there's a uh, Democratic Assembly, right? And a Democratic well, there, there's been a Democratic Assembly for quite some time. It's been the, the state Senate that's been controlled by the Republicans. Right. Uh, but now we have a situation where the Democrats now have a two-seat majority in the state Senate. However, there are some arcane political maneuverings going on which uh, leave it up to question as to who is going to be the Senate majority leader come January. Because there are two or three renegade Democrats who are talking about voting for yeah. Dean Skelos, who actually is my state senator. Oh, really? Yes. And he, what's his position on the Rockefeller drug laws? Um, I met with his counsel back mm -hmm. in the spring doing sure. an advocacy day for Drop the Rock, which is mm -hmm. one of the organizations that's working to repeal the Rockefeller drug laws. Sure. And um, his counsel was supportive in terms of giving us an ear, but in terms of actually getting response from them, um, not so much. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he has a traditional, I think, suburban Republican kind of law and order mindset. I see. And hasn't really been interested in taking this and issue And he might on. very well become the next uh, state Senate majority leader. Or he leader. might sta actually stay as state majority leader because he has been Senate majority leader since Joe Bruno stepped down. Oh, of course. Thank you. See, we, this guy is an expert. We're live, by the way. You can call us, 212-757-1538. Doug Green's our, uh, our guest, an expert on drug policy. And in general, just a very knowledgeable person when it comes to New York state politics, which is... Uh, uh, an area that has so much uh, import to us, but often is uh, people don't think about it. But really, a lot of the laws that we face uh, come from the state of New York, you know, more than the federal government, more than the city. Right, especially when we're talking about uh, drug law enforcement. Yeah. The vast majority of drug law enforcement is really state and local, not federal. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, so talking about law enforcement, I have uh, what we have behind me is the uh, cover from yes. a very interesting report. We can do it again, repealing today's failed prohibition. Uh, and it's presented by the Law Enforcement Against Prohibition and Criminal Justice Policy Foundation. Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, LEAP. LEAP, right? yeah. Fascinating, relatively new group on the drug policy reform scene. And soon. actually made up of current or former or current and former? It's, it's, um, it's really, in the United States, it's former law enforcement. Unfortunately, in other countries, like in the United Kingdom, there are people who are currently on the force who feel empowered to speak out on drug policy reform. But in the United States, it's a, a political kiss of death. I mean, I, I, was at a, I was at a rally on Saturday that was not related to drug policy and wound up talking to the cops. And they were, you know, they were supportive of, the, of, of legalizing marijuana. At least one of them was willing to come out and say that to me. The, the other one had said, well, you know, I wasn't born with this uniform. And actually, when I was in high school in the early 90s, I, I came to the mm -hmm. pot parade. Uh -huh, uh, but, but he wouldn't kind of go on the record uh, calling for reform. Right. But this is a matter of keeping your job. Right. And the powers that be. Right. In this country, being a, taking a government salary and speaking your mind do not necessarily go hand in not, hand. Not at all, unfortunately. Right. Okay. Unlike other countries, which don't have as many protections, it seems, as the United States for freedom of speech, but that's where they draw the line here. Right. Okay. Now, these former, mostly former uh, law enforcement uh, professionals, uh, wrote this report, and what is this report? I, I, I love the photographs. As you can, I hope you can see them clearly enough behind us. Uh, there's a, 
A Daily Mirror headline, Prohibition Ends at Last. There's a poster uh, of right above us, a copy of a poster, Prohibition Failed, and a woman with her hand out protecting her child against uh, organized crime. Um, there's uh, uh, repression or depression. It's linking the depression to uh, prohibition. Uh, we have uh, some folks over here on the left behind my head who are pouring out a, uh, a barrel of beer into the street. We have a stack of $100 bills. Uh, below that, uh, works, heroin works, a poppy flower. Um, and you can't see some of these below us. I love the top behind, uh, behind Doug, our guest. You can see, why don't you swing a little bit around, Doug? Uh, and put your head back a little bit. And we can see these guys with the Tommy guns. And above them, some other uh, law enforcement professionals uh, uh, with some captured beer in kegs and bottles. Uh, I think it's fascinating. I love the cover. Uh, what does this report tell us? Their security demands you vote repeal. I love that poster. What's this all about? Right. Well, the report is timed to the fact that this week in 1933, 75 years ago, was uh, when Utah became the final state necessary, Utah of all places. Uh, Mormon uh, Utah, right? Mormon Utah, where you know you need to go to a, uh, a liquor store, a state-run liquor store, to get full-strength beer, because yeah. otherwise you have to get the uh, the, the half beer. Right. Um, became the the ratifying state to uh, enact the 21st Amendment to repeal alcohol prohibition. So they came out with this report this week Maybe and did a... Some people might not know that there was a time when alcohol was prohibited. You could not possess or buy alcohol. I know actually, actually you, you could possess. That is one of the differences between the current drug war and the, the war on alcohol back then. There weren't laws against possession. There were laws against manufacturing and distributing and selling alcohol. But there was no law against possession like we have now with uh, currently illicit drugs. So they had in, in the 1920s, during this period of time, it was from 1919 to 1933, right. uh, there was a, this law, national federal le re legislation in place, and really a, a, a amendment to the United States right. Constitution. Right. I, I believe there actually was legislation called the Volstead Act. But the, the, in order to, uh, enact, mm -hmm. to, to make the Volstead Act operational, they needed to amend the Constitution which they did with the... Uh, right, and that put an end to, to... But it didn't put an end to liquor because, obviously, uh, you had speakeasies. New York was famous for speakeasies. Just watch uh, Ragtime, I think, and some of those other movies that show what New York was like, especially the Harlem Renaissance. In the 1920s, during the height of the Harlem Renaissance, when New Yorkers probably went out more at night and partied more than they do even today, alcohol flowed freely. But it was totally illegal. It was totally illegal. A lot of the times, it was really poisonous too. Oh, really? It was heavily adulterated, as uh, many illegal drugs are now. It was bathtub, bathtub gin. Okay, uh, made in downstairs in somebody's, and you could have anything in that, right? You Just could like have today. Right. People went blind from drinking uh, wood alcohol. That uh -huh. was a contaminant of the manufacturing process. Wow.